But what what is true, uh, and I'm, I'm actually being serious here, is is that uh, there are uh, there's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. We can't explain uh, how they moved, their trajectory. Uh, they, they did not have um, an easily explainable pattern. This clip is from May of 2021 on The Late Show with James Corden. And I think a lot of us probably have forgotten about this assessment that former head of state Barack Obama conveyed recently. And I think the reason we forgot is simply because we've been inundated with UFO news on basically a daily basis. And oftentimes the news is quite significant. Now, had Barack Obama stated these words many years ago, I think that it would have registered as even more significant than it does now, and we would not have been so prone to forget. The reason these words are significant is because I do not assess that they are based upon him just reiterating all the news that has come out about UFOs. Now, some have suggested that's the case. I take issue with that. Whether you agree with Barack Obama's politics or not, I think it's clear that this is a guy with a lot of acumen, and I don't think he would just state something like that on account of the news. So my perception is that it's likely that those words are stemming from his experience being president. Recall that Obama was president for two full terms from 2009 to 2017. And during his presidency, ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, a program designated to study UAP, was going on. And so it is highly plausible that during his presidency, he was briefed on this phenomenon. And what makes this significant is that this phenomenon is simply a mystery. It was a mystery to ATIP and... Obama has highlighted the mystery of UAP. These are real objects that are detected by our sensor systems, and we do not know what they are. Consequently, this is as scientific of a mystery as one could possibly have. The following clip is of political science professor Alexander Wendt speaking at a TEDx event from February of 2020. The title of this event is Wanted a Science of UFOs. Now, just prior to the clip, he explains that humanity is an extremely curious species. So curious, in fact, that we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars building building giant radio telescopes to search for intelligent life from distant stars, even though there is not a shred of evidence that any intelligent life from distant stars exists. He goes on to say, But when it comes to UFOs, not a cent. The scientific community has never done any serious, sustained, systematic study of UFO phenomena. And that's in spite of the fact that if it were found that some UFOs were ETs, or extraterrestrials, it would be one of the most important events in human history. And yet scientists give us only silence and or ridicule for people who are UFO believers. Okay. And of course, that's because they believe that UFOs don't exist. So my first challenge in challenging this taboo is to make the case that UFOs actually are real phenomena. And I think that's the crux of the matter, isn't it? UFOs have always been a real phenomena, always been a deep mystery. There's just so much witness testimony going back decades and decades. Much of it, or at least some of it, is highly corroborated. Some of it coming from accomplished military personnel. There have been documents retrieved from Freedom of Information Act where the U.S. government 
has spoken soberly about the existence of UFOs and not knowing exactly what it's all about. And so this mystery is not a new mystery. It's an old mystery. It's a, an entrenched mystery. It's not a, it never was a theoretical mystery. The bottom line is people were seeing things. And not only were they seeing things, but they were seeing the same kind of shapes over and over again. Flying saucers, triangles, cigar-shaped are some of the more consistent reports. And, and, but, but, but nevertheless, this was basically ignored by the scientific community. And I'll get into why that may be a little later. But what I think has waken up the scientific community, as demonstrated, frankly, by the Galileo Project, headed by Harvard professor, astrophysicist Avi Loeb, is that it has now become unavoidable to ignore UFOs. You just can't do it anymore because officialdom has gotten to a level where it is now. And when I say that, I mean the U.S. government has been forced. And yes, forced is the right word. Do not forget, ladies and gentlemen, that a, a high-level employee of the Department of Defense had to step down from his post for this all to ensue. Because the U.S. government has been so reluctant to speak about this real scientific phenomena but and so his stepping down subsequently new york times covering it subsequently the navy admitting that yeah we there are ufos we don't know what they are subsequently the department of defense officially admitting that what's in those you ufo gun camera videos are real objects and we don't know what they are subsequent to that having a UAP task force, subsequent to that, now there's pressure in the United States government to have hearings on UFOs. And, 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 and 60 Minutes covered UFOs, 60 Minutes being the most respected television show within the United States in terms of, of giving n credible news and so forth. All of this, this big tidal wave of of giving this subject credibility has forced scientists to stop ignoring this phenomenon. And of course, I forgot the UAP report that came out recently where they further admitted that this is a real phenomenon that has been recorded on multiple sensors. Therefore, on account of that, we really can't say that it's a glitch, not when it happens, not when it's detected by multiple sensors. So... This is what it has taken for science to start to put their foot through the door, to start looking through that proverbial telescope, as it were. This is what this has taken. Is that reasonable? Not really. But nevertheless, this is a beautiful outcome because this is what we needed. We need our scientists to investigate this phenomenon. L Luis, let me ask you a question, and maybe this is a question for, for all of us and even in the audience. You know, why is it that we're okay with NASA spending millions of dollars of our taxpayer money looking for microbial life on Mars? And why is it okay for us to spend uh, historically millions of dollars of our taxpayer money looking for a search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the SETI program, using radio telescopes, trying to find technical signatures of, of intelligence uh, within our, our galaxy and beyond. And yet to, to do that very same endeavor uh, in light of all the evidence, we have a resistance doing it right here on our own planet. What, why, why do you suppose that is? That clip in which Luis Elizondo was asking that question is taken from Luis Jimenez's YouTube channel, the Unidentified Celebrity Review. This was from April of 2021 from an event called the Big Phone Home, of which I was part of. Anyways, in the following clip, Graham Rendell interjects and gives his take on why we are in the situation we are currently as it pertains to UAP. I got you. We're, uh, we're, we're, at, the, we're at a point what? where, sorry, okay. we're, we're at a point where back in the days when people thought the earth was flat, 
there was an argument about some people were coming up with it with a well no it's actually a sphere but you you got you got burned at the stake for saying such a thing we're at that point at the moment where everybody still thinks that's an influence still thinks that the earth is flat and there's only a few of us the dissenting voices saying no it's it's a ball you know and that's where we are and we're just trying to break through that kind of mindset that everybody just anybody in any kind of position of influence power you name it is actually saying no we're still living on a flat earth yeah I'd you like know to when galileo point. well you know when galileo first pr proposed looking through the telescope proposed that the earth with uh, along with copernicus was was not the center of the solar system you know there were people who refused to look through the telescope and, and, and right. he said, look, just, all you have to do is look through the telescope. They said, no, we're, we're, we're not going to do it. I do sympathize with Graham Rendell's view. I don't think it's perfectly analogous to trying to tell the world that the, that, that, that the world is actually round and not flat, simply because obviously we have forensic proof that demonstrates a thousand times over that the, the world is round and not flat. Whereas with UFOs, that level of forensic proof is not accessible to us. However, I would argue that the, the witness testimony that has emerged over the decades, coupled with what our government is doing now, coupled with people that have come out of, out of positions of, of high levels in, in, in the U.S. government and elsewhere who have stated this is all real, when you, when you account for that, at the very minimum, I think it's unreasonable. And I, yeah, I'm going to say that again to, to emphasize it. I think it's unreasonable to be so certain that, they're, that the UFOs are just misidentifications or weather phenomena. That's not logical to me. And so on some level, it does feel like us quote unquote believers, although our assessment is based on evidence, it does feel like we're trying to coax the world to wake up to this reality. But then of course, ultimately we do need that forensic evidence. If we don't get that forensic evidence, we will be at a stalemate. My, my, my interest area does go back to some experiences I had uh, as a child. And I, and I think I use those kinds of experiences as pivot points to uh, understand why some people find it easy to get involved in under, trying to understand the phenomenon. What did I see? What was that? Uh, versus those who come to the same conclusion via evidence, right? They don't have to experience it, but the evidence becomes so overwhelming that you realize that something unusual is going on. And I would say that someone like John Mack, for instance, falls into that category as an academic who uh, hadn't any experience in the arena personally, but uh, does know the difference between a lie and a, you know, a psychological delusion and somebody who believes that they're telling the truth. And so scientists always look for patterns. And what I started to realize as, uh, I suppose, frankly, the internet became available that uh, there were more than a few people who'd had similar experiences and other people who'd investigated this, such as John Mack. And so you have to ask yourself the question, well, once you start to see a pattern in the data, um, wh why disbelieve the messenger? And so you have to ask yourself the question, well, once you start to see a pattern in the data, um, wh why disbelieve the messenger? And isn't that the crux of the matter? When a pattern emerges, a pattern that has established itself over many years and decades, people from all walks of life, including Dr. Gary Nolan, who you just saw on video coming from an interview with MJ Benias, He's an experiencer. His experiences that he states he had line up, line up with other people. So why would I disregard what he has to say? Why would I assume he's wrong? When a pattern has emerged, and people know what they experience. I'm eating a donut. Now, an hour from now, someone could say, hey man, what did you do an hour, an hour ago? Um, I had a donut. You know, that's 
probably not as smart an example as I thought it was when I was thinking it over, but you get, you get my gist. At this point, I want to share with you some details of a sighting a friend of mine named Finn Hanley had in September of 2008 in England. Some very quick details right off the bat. It was corroborated by multiple witnesses. He recorded all the details after it happened, so it's not like he went days and days without registering it on paper. And potentially most importantly, this sighting was utterly unambiguous. And that is so important to emphasize because I think people make this assumption unjustified that all sightings are ambiguous. They see a light in the sky. They don't know what it is. Maybe even they see it do some kind of weird maneuver, but it's still ambiguous because it's just a light in the sky, right? Regardless of if it did a, a 90 degree right hand turn. But, but some sightings do not express that kind of ambiguity. Some sightings are crystal clear, completely and utterly unambiguous. Now, we can argue whether a person's rendition is accurate or not. What we cannot argue is that all sightings are unambiguous. No, not as they are reported. And, you know, I don't care if the vast majority of sightings are people who are seeing prosaic things. And I'm sure that's obviously the case. What I do care about is the potential that some are seeing what they said they saw. And I believe that that is the case. And one of the reasons I believe that is what Dr. Gary Nolan stated. If a pattern emerges over many years, why disbelieve the messenger? I don't. Uh, I don't find that to be logical. On the other hand, I'm, I'm reasonable in my subjective opinion, because I won't go so far to say that we can say that with 100% certainty, some people are seeing what they say they saw. What I'm trying to say it is, is that it's absolutely crazy to assume that everyone is just completely off the mark. I wouldn't bet on that. Not in a million years. So his sighting happened in September of 2008 in England while he was driving a taxi car multiple witnesses the first thing he saw were two orbs one with a spike coming out of it it was so clear and 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 the 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 orbs were so clear that he actually was concerned and was glad to get a little distance from them while he continued to drive but he ultimately did pull over and as I understand it, when he looked again, th this is what he saw. Two triangles, extremely clear, close proximity. He even said that he could see some of the ambient light underneath them from the lights for the road. And I'm not going to go further into it than that. There's a lot of details about his story, and this is his most accurate rendition that he could do of, of exactly the angle and the size and the parameters that he experienced the night this happened. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the first link under my description be a link to a 30-minute video that he put together talking about his sighting. And I recommend all my subscribers take a look because to me, this personifies the quality of sightings some people actually have. And speaking of not jumping the gun by disbelieving the messenger when a pattern has emerged, the premier examination of these triangle vehicle or craft sightings, whatever they may end up being, is by author David Marler in the book Triangular UFOs, An Estimate of the Situation. So if you want to learn more about this pattern that has a, that has established itself, this would be the book to do it with. Now, one of the reasons I think a lot of people disbelieve or have extraordinary levels of skepticism that people are actually seeing what they say they saw is because whether consciously or not, they assume that they would know if something of this profundity was happening to humanity. 
And I think that way of thinking falls under the umbrella of the fallacy of centrality. So let me give you a uh, a quick um, reading from an article. The other day I was thinking of the danger of organizations that make central leaders the collecting or decision point too often. I then happened on an article which included a note on the fallacy of centrality. Research Ron Westrom, observing the diagnostic practices of pediatricians in the 1940s and 1950s, spotted what he has come to call the fallacy of centrality. The fallacy is this. Under the assumption that you are in a central position, you presume that if something serious were happening, you would know about it. And since you don't know about it, it isn't happening. It is precisely this distortion that kept pediatricians from diagnosing child abuse until the early 1960s. Their reasoning, if parents were abusing their children, I'd know about it. Since I don't know about it, it isn't happening. I'm going to share with you a Twitter video I made very recently because it has overtones of the fallacy of centrality and will help drive my point home that much more. I recently watched a video on Reddit in which various people spoke about their experiences alleged in which they saw beings come into their bedroom and take them against their will and then they juxtaposed that with the kids from the aerial school landing describing beings and the beings were described the same by both those claiming they were abducted and by those that were present at the school landing, the classic grays. And it got me thinking that one of the reasons I think a lot of people struggle believing that we're actually being engaged by non-human intelligence to the extent that beings are going into people's bedrooms and landing at schools and walking around gardens and so forth is simply because How could that be the case when the vast majority of the world is ignoring this topic? That juxtaposition alone, I think, is is a huge component of why people struggle to believe that we are being engaged by non-human intelligence. And that's an understandable reason to feel so hesitant to buy into this, to, to all these claims. I never want to be a complete believer. I always want to be a cautious believer until I actually see the smoking gun evidence myself. However, lately, I've been really thinking about this whole UAP thing, and I've been been more persuaded than ever that, that this is really happening. And I've just been realizing that one of the reasons people reject that, that this is happening is what I just went over, that there's no way it's happening on this scale and simultaneously, people are ignoring this. That's just that that those two things cannot exist at the same time. I think that is commonly what goes through people's minds. Add on to that pile that there are elements within the U.S. government that know for a fact that this is happening, and they're covering it up, and they're capable of covering it up. When you look at all of these elements, it is it is a natural resp- response to say there's no way. But I would argue that we humans are part of the phenomenon intrinsically in terms of weirdness because the fact that this is all coexisting simultaneously is as potentially weird as the phenomenon itself. Now, uh, about a month ago, and we are uh, currently exactly a month after the announcement, there was a report delivered to uh, Congress by the Pentagon about unidentified aerial phenomena. Um, And the report stated that there are objects that uh, are likely real based on detection by multiple instruments, but their nature is unclear. And that's quite an unusual admission by the government, the most conservative organization that I I know of. That was, of course, the head of the Galileo Project, Professor Avi Loeb of Harvard. And that presentation was on July 26, 2021. But I think Avi really got at the heart of the matter. The U.S. government has admitted that there is some sort of stuff out there detected on multiple sensors, and they don't really have a handle on what it is. And so, of course, that would be intriguing to the scientific community, or at least should be intriguing, because that seems like an amazing mystery, particularly when you acknowledge the degree of fidelity that the best sensor systems in the world are able to attain from the American military apparatus. Finally, we will just not engage in retroactive attempts to exist, to analyze existing images or partial radar or infrared data, 
So much of that is out there. We will not speculate on prior UAPs, on alleged or real observations or anecdotes or legends, um, as these are just not conductive to rigorously cross-validated evidence-based scientific explanations which we are seeking. So that may sound a little bit boring, but we want to stay within our clearly defined limitations, which are still incredibly exciting, and we have a clearly defined scope. The person you just heard talking is the co-founder of the Project Galileo. His name is Frank Lauken. He's a visiting scholar He's from the Department of Chemistry as well as Chemical Biology. And I agree with his take here that they should not get preoccupied with any data that precedes them. Now, that being said, do I think the U.S. government has forensic scientific proof of a non-human intelligence engaging our world? The answer is I believe they have that a thousand times over, and I am not being hyperbolic. I believe they have decades and decades of accumulated data that is irrefutable. However, not everyone has to go that route, nor should they. They're, these are not activists. These are not people who are interested in philosophy. And if we're being honest, the idea that the U.S. government has acquired this level of epistemology on UFOs is partly based in philosophical perspective, simply because I look at the evidence available and I infer that to be the case. And while I'm highly confident that's the case, it's still ultimately an interpretation. And these are scientists who have the highest threshold for evidence. So they're not going to get into the weeds with, with what I'm talking about, that there is significant ef uh, evidence that the U.S. government has this level of data. Um, they're, they're also not going to be impressed either by even the epistemology of a court system. So while what I'm speaking of may not resonate with them, that doesn't mean there isn't validity to it. Oh, I'm highly confident there's validity to it. Nevertheless, that's not really their wheelhouse, nor should it be. The fact of the matter is, if this is a real phenomenon, which I think we can all agree that it is, no, no, you could argue, well, it's just, it's just planes or drones. Yeah, it could be. I doubt it, but it could be. But it's a real phenomenon, regardless of what it ever ends up being. And so they're doing the right thing. They're acquiring scientific tools to get repetitive data on an unexplained phenomenon. What else more could we ask for? It should be noted that Christopher Plain wrote an article for The Debrief published on June 30th, 2021, titled Respected Astrobiologist Says DOD Must Release UFO Data If They Want a Scientific Study. The article opens up on the heels of recent statements by Bill Nelson saying NASA would begin studying UFOs. The space agency's new chief says he thinks we are not alone. While many at NASA have been left scratching their heads, one renowned astrobiologist, Abel Mendez, says it's a moot point unless NASA can get its hands on the classified UFO data held by the Pentagon. So while Abel Mendez has a point, I also think that it doesn't contradict the utility of Frank Lauken and Avi Loeb's approach to getting data on UAP because I think the best approach is a multifaceted one. Let people like Avi Loeb and Frank Lauken pursue data independent of what's already been collected and also, let's have scientists like Abel Mendez really underscore the necessity for the Pentagon to give them data so that they can <clears throat> look into UAP in the most efficient way. Both are valid and necessary. And so this would be a holistic approach. Let's include into that equation someone like Gary Nolan, who I've already spoken about, who is looking into metamaterials looking to see if they have exotic isotopic ratios, giving the impression that these materials have been engineered in a way that surpasses human technological ability, giving the impression that they may not stem from human civilization. So, so the holistic approach involves many necessary avenues.
I should say that um, uh, although I'm a theorist, uh, my approach to this is uh, very observational. Um, I think that uh, we should not, not have any prejudice, any prior assumptions. It's a fishing expedition. Let's just go out and catch whatever fish we find. And that includes objects close to Earth, hovering within our atmosphere, or objects that came from outside the solar system that look weird, that do not look like the rocks we have seen before within the solar system. And, you know, it's a purely observational question. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, there was a paper published in Nature Astronomy magazine uh, by a philosopher trying to argue why Oumuamua cannot be of artificial origin. And to me, it was a repetition of the mistake made by philosophers back in the days of Galileo. The point is, we should not argue philosophically about this. We should collect enough data to tell us the difference between a rock and an artificial object. And that's the aim of the Galileo project without prejudice. Let's just monitor our sky, not rely on military personnel or government owned sensors. Let's look at it just like astronomers look at distant objects. Now it's true that at some point they're going to look at Amuamua-like objects as well as satellites that could stem from extraterrestrial civilizations. However, that's way down the line. That's going to require much more funding. Right now, they're, 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 their only focus, frankly, is UAP in our atmosphere. I love how Avi Loeb is like, let's not discuss philosophy. I don't care why you think something can't be X or why something can't be Y. I don't care about that. Let's just get the equipment and start doing scientific investigation. And this is so important because... So many scientists over the years have given their philosophical arguments on why UAP can't be alien, on why UAP are most likely this or most likely that. And Avi Loeb's like, I don't care what your philosophy is. I don't care what your justification is for your assessment. I don't care. I want to go into this investigation without prejudice and simply set up telescopes Look at the sky, see what we find. Brilliant, objective, rational. Some people who think they're so rational are actually immersed in ego and foolishness. But, they, but, they're, but they're so convinced, they're so convinced of their rationality. And I call, I call them out on that, as does Avi Loeb. Now, here is my understanding of the situation. Right now, they've acquired $1.7 million from wealthy donors, and their hopes are to acquire more money. In the initial stages, they're going to pursue 10 telescopes with 10-inch diameters, but as they acquire more, more money, they're going to pursue 3-meter telescopes, 3-meter diameters, and those things cost a half a million dollars a piece, whereas the 10 inch telescopes cost much less. So right now, my understanding is they're going for 10 telescopes with 10 inch diameters, but they'd like to get 10 times the funding and have a hundred of those telescopes and have a complete network where they can really look at the sky for UAP, something that has been reported for decades. And they're going to have a computer system applied so that it filters out stuff like birds because if there is no filter they would get way too much data and they would there'd be not enough time to sift through it and there's also mechanists on the team to create any kind of um, hardware that they may need in this endeavor there's there's a lot of really uh, talented scientists and I think even engineers who are part of this effort and so one of the first things someone like me may consider, and someone like you potentially is, well, if, if we are right, and I think we are, at least those who agree with me, that we are dealing with non-human intelligence, well then, we cannot rule out that when you're dealing with an intelligence that may be thousands of times more intelligent than human beings and our level of technology, for, for their own reasons, they may want to avoid being studied. And, and, and I, I think we need to be careful in saying, oh, that's so convenient. Well, wait a minute. 
We just don't know. You know, they have may have they may be a post singularity civilization where they've they've acquired extremely high levels of nanotechnology, femtotechnology, artificial intelligence, genetic manipulation of their minds so that they become smarter, which leads to, for example, even better artificial intelligence. The the the, the quickening of of acceleration in, in, in technological advancements in a post-singularity civilization is unfathomable to us. They may acquire more knowledge in an hour than we do in a, th in, 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 in a year, for example. I, I don't know. I'm, this is not my expertise. But the point is, that's always something that's a possibility. But, but, that, but, but, I, but I love Avi Loeb's uh, philosophy. He doesn't care about what could be. Just as he does, like, for example, what I said could be the situation. He doesn't care. Good. He also doesn't care about those cynical scientists who want to, t who want to tell you why UFOs can't be uh, non-human intelligence. He doesn't care about that either. All he cares about is collecting data. And I think that's really intelligent, right? Get rid of the prejudice and just collect data. Because the bottom line is UFOs have been seen for decades and some of them, in my opinion, are highly unambiguous sightings where people are seeing something very detailed. Just like if you looked up and saw a plane, you could see the wings, you could see the, the windows, you could see the tail, you could see the exhaust, you could see a whole bunch of intricacies. Likewise, I believe people have seen UAP with that same level of unambiguousness, except it's not a plane, it's something completely different and unknown. So my hope is that with this endeavor by Avi Loeb, and his team and all of this extremely advanced technology and this long-term systematic investigation that has never been done in the history of science. As Alexander Wendt has said, Laukin made that point too in this presentation, by the way. My hope is that by finally looking through the telescope at this level, they will make a discovery of whatever UAP are. They will get that high resolution photograph, multiple high level, uh, high resolution photographs and whatever, whatever other instrumentation they have to cross check because this is a bona fide scientific investigation. They're gonna try to get as much repetition and, and cross checking as they can because of the high threshold of epistemology that science deals in. Now, like I said before, do I think that the US government already has that? Of course I do. I do. And I, and I don't think I'm being unreasonable. I think I'm being reasonable. I think that my assessment in that regard will be vindicated ultimately. And it's, you know, ask Elizondo. He would tell you the same thing. Now, I'm not saying we should rely on Elizondo, right? Because he can't lie or he can't be mistaken. Of course he can be. And I, this, that goes beyond the scope of this video. But he's not the only one that has stated this. In a previous video, I showed you Commander David Fravor talking about looking at the radar tape and being, having his mind blown at the, at the maneuvers of the Tic Tac. In a recent interview with Jeremy Corbell, Commander Chad Underwood talked about that same radar tape, right? And that's just one example, just one from 2004. UAP is, is a long-standing mystery that, the, that many militaries of our Earth have contended with. They don't know what they are. They have flight signatures that are well beyond any known technology. Now, unfortunately, I can't prove that because I don't have the classified data. But if you think that classified data must not exist because UAP must not exist, then all I got to say is you might be naive. Skepticism is one thing. But being so certain that there's another explanation is naivety, in my opinion. There's just too much of a history. There's too much corroboration. There's too many corroborated sightings. There's too many documents. There's too many people who have come out of the government saying this is real. Elizondo is one of the latest iterations, but this is nothing new. And that's why I put my chips on, we are dealing with non-human intelligence. Now, some people will say, well, if we were truly dealing with non-human intelligence, then video cameras and smartphones would have collected this data already. Well, my, my, my response to that is, 
things are not always as you expect them to be. So at the moment we start getting into expectations, we start getting into philosophy. That's not science, that's philosophy. And you could argue I'm also getting into philosophy. Sure, but I would argue that I am harnessing the epistemolo epistemological model of a court system where you can have a situation where witness testimony can lead to someone being convicted. And yet, we have that witness testimony by the thousands and thousands and thousands, including government documents. If I'm on that jury, if I'm on that jury, I'm going to be honest. I'm saying there's something unknown, technological, and we don't know what it is. Now, if you want to be purely objective, yes, we don't know if it's non-human intelligence. But to me, it kind of lends itself to that interpretation. You're dealing with unknown technology that has capabilities beyond any known technology. That's what's been reported over and over and over again by really good observers, people saying the classified data exists, but they can't show up because it's classified. And you've, you have stories of people seeing beings from all over the world and describing these beings in the, in, the, in, the, in the precise same way and having the same kind of experiences over and over and over again. Hearkening back to Gary Nolan talking about, you know, if a pattern emerges, why would you, why would you disbelieve the messenger? I hope this bears fruit. This is a great quote from Avi Loeb. I love it for its beautiful simplicity and truth. My point is, let's be modest. Let's be humble. Let's not assume that we know the answer in advance and simply check the sky and figure out what is around us. I'm at the 41 minute mark, and so I'm about to wrap this up. One thing Avi Loeb said is that whenever you look at the sky in a new way, you learn something new. So it's a win-win situation. So whether or not they're able to get it to the bottom of UAP, it's guaranteed with all those telescopes looking at the sky, they're gonna learn something new scientifically. And this is what we've wanted. We've wanted scientific investigation. We're getting what we wanted. And I, I think it's absolutely important that Avi Loeb and his team do what they do. I think it's absolutely important that people like Gary Nolan looking at metamaterials, seeing if they have interesting um, components leading to the assessment that they may be constructed from another intelligence. And I think it's important that we also have people pushing the government to be more transparent on what they already know. And I think it's important that we push for hearings, public hearings, so that people can be subpoenaed and talk under oath about what they know about UAP. I think all of these efforts are absolutely imperative, and I support all of them. And I believe that we have a right to know about the truth of our universe. And hopefully, we will get to the bottom of UAP. And, and, and maybe I'm wrong about it all. You know, maybe it's atmospheric or it's all misidentifications. But there's a reason I bet heavily against that. And it's because I don't think the evidence points in that direction. Please do not forget to subscribe. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can check out my merch shop. You can become a patron. You can become a YouTube member. You can give me a one-time donation. All of those potentials are in the description below. Or you could just slap a like on this bad boy and I'll appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Special thanks to all the YouTube members and patrons, those who have bought merch, those who have given me donations. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. See you in the next episode.